Uneducated Economist here. So what do we talk about while we wait for some people to get in on the uh, live stream? Um, I don't know. I went and got my teeth cleaned this morning. Like, I know, like, that's not really exciting for a lot of people out there, but I haven't actually gone and had my teeth cleaned for quite some time. It's a little embarrassing to say, but um, I tell you, they feel a whole lot better today now that I've had them uh, scraped off, you know, all that shit scraped off of them. And uh, it's pretty weird to think, because, like, I grew up in the military. Like, my dad was in the military. He was in the Coast Guard. And, like, I went to the dentist, like, every six months, like, my entire life. So I always had, like, really good teeth. Like, you know, they, you know, my teeth were always well taken care of, you know, being in the military like that. But for some reason, I don't know about, like, I don't know, probably somewhere in my, like, late 20s, early 30s, I got really lazy about it. Like, going in and getting my teeth cleaned and going to the dentist and stuff. So trying to get back into that habit again. I mean, I always brush my teeth and take really good care of them, like, personally. But, you know, that stuff builds up. And if you don't go and have them clean, then you end up with... A lot of crap on your teeth. So, anyway, fun stuff to talk about. All right, we got 25 of you. That's close enough. Let's talk about whether or not inflation is over instead of talking about our teeth, right? Is inflation really over? Um, I keep hearing people say that, and I keep seeing these articles popping up about how, you know, we're over the hill of inflation. Like, you know, the, the scary inflation is now gone and passed. And um, I think that's kind of wishful thinking. I think we might actually experience inflation again, or at least prices moving up, but not necessarily in the same fashion or for the same reasons that we had experienced just recently. Now, I know like it's really easy for people to understand inflation when people, you know, when the central banks print money, prices go up. I mean, that's really easy for people to say, but it's a little more than that. It's like actually quite a bit more than that because Inflation is the expansion of money and credit. Prices are the symptoms of inflation. And that's like very, very important to try and wrap your head around. Because if you understand that it's not just a matter of just the money printing or the expansion of money and credit, but it's also the injection of that money into the system. See, like quantitative easing one, two, three, and four had a lot of money printing taking place and it really swelled the bank's balance sheets but it really just pretty much sat as reserves. And unless that money was lent into the system, it really didn't start chasing the goods and services out there like we had experienced here just recently. Now, the big differences between quantitative easing one, two, three, and four, and the quantitative easing that we experienced here just recently in the inflation scenario that came from it was the fact that the money was given out as stimulus checks for everybody to go out there and spend into the economy, all right? Now, that's a major difference. See, like before, you had to go out and take out a debt. Like you wanted to go out and take out a mortgage debt or a car loan or a credit card debt or something like that. But a... are you guys hearing me okay? Oh, yeah, he must be dental health as wife. Okay. Um, so it's not just a matter of, of printing up the money and, and having it. It's printing up the money and stimulating the economy with money injections. So as people got a hold of that money, they started going off there and spending that into the economy. Now that alone would, you know, increase the demand, you know, and you get supply and demand imbalance. So if you have supply and you have a demand increase, well, then prices would go up from that too. But then it would be very short lived as soon as the stimulus ran out, the, the demand would come back down to normal, whatever that's supposed to be. And then it would, prices would balance out again. But that's not what happened here just recently. We had this huge demand take place from the stimulus, and then they severed the supply chain. And you saw supply drop dramatically. And that's the reason why you saw so much inflation taking place. And that if we hadn't seen the severing of the supply chain, we may not have experienced such dramatic inflation like we did. I mean, when you have a hundred freighters sitting off the port of LA and California in general, when you have the trains hubs all locked up, when you had containers sitting in shopping malls that were not getting the material or the products onto the shelves, even though it's that close, unless it actually makes it to the point that it can be retailed, like sold, then it's not in supply, right? And so that was the severing of the supply chain that really caused that supply demand imbalance and the prices really started to swell after that. So. What we're seeing now is that the supply has become a lot more prevalent out there, right? You know, everything is starting to free up a lot more. The 
demand coming from the consumer is starting to come down as their stimulus is running out and concern about whether or not they're going to be able to be employed into the future is starting to become a little bit more of a of an issue for people you're starting to see the demand really come down but the supply isn't necessarily coming back right in the same fashion that it was prior to the pandemic i mean just take a look at china take a look at you know what is the trucking company yellow you know yellow freight or whatever they you know these people the manufacturers the distributors they're not in the game right they're like man we are out of here we're done right because if you don't have a consumer then that's our customer what are we going to be you know investing into nothing right there's nothing there for us so that's where i said it a while ago is that the the supply side is not coming to help the fed right they're not going to come and help alleviate the the inflation that they are experiencing because they know damn well that if they are to invest into this system in the in the in the way it is right now that the customer is not going to be there to support that investment so they're out of here right now if you think about like what could come from the future of this well if the manufacturers and the distributors are not in the game what ends up happening to all that stuff right it fails to get into the system whether you sever it on purpose and say hey you're not getting any stuff because we're not allowing anybody to drive trucks or unload these ships or whatever i mean whatever reason you want to put towards it it's the fact that there isn't stuff in the system Right? So you can put that excuse on it, or you can put an excuse, hey, there's no freight, or there's no trucking available, or there's less trucking available, and there's less merchandise being produced. It's the same thing, right? The, the outcome would be the same, less stuff, and then if a demand picks up for it, prices are going to go up. So yeah, we're seeing inflation coming down right now, but we're also seeing issues taking place on the supply side of things. And if the issues on the supply side of things continue into the future, that's going to have inflation being pushed, right? Being pushed up, not just alleviated from the demand side of things. There's a whole supply side of things too. Like a lot of times people forget about that, thinking that the supply will just be there magically. Like it's just like, it's just magically going to be there, you know? But it doesn't work like that. It's, you know, there actually has to be investment to, towards it. Meaning that the people who are on that side of things have to like assume that there is going to be a customer there that they can sell their products to. And if they don't see that happening, then they're backing away too. That in itself could drive inflation higher. And that's not something I think a lot of people are looking at. Like, just take a look at the article I leave down in the description. I mean, they're talking about the Federal Reserve trying to fight inflation by keeping the interest rates elevated. And I mean, what, are, what were they trying to say in here? I don't know, something about how like, as inflation comes down, it's going to drive the gold prices up or something like that. Like, I mean, everybody sold gold off the idea that inflation was going to hurt them. Now they're trying to sell gold off the idea that inflation is going to come down. Like, which one is it? Do you buy gold because of inflation going up or inflation coming down? Like, which one do you buy? Um, to me, like, gold is not a good hedge against inflation. I know a lot of people are going to roll their eyes and get art and mad about that, whatever. I mean, take it for what it is. I look at gold and silver as an insurance policy because that's really what it does for me. It's never really protected me against inflation, but it has been there for me when I was completely broke and had no vehicle and had no way of getting to work. Opening up a box of silver, pulling out 165 ounces and having a guy sign a title to a Tahoe over to me was probably one of the coolest things that I've ever had in my life. So definitely a, a believer in gold and silver. All right, let's continue on here. Let's go up to the top. All right, yes, sir, recession was canceled. I don't know about canceled, but it certainly doesn't seem to be as much of a concern for the people as it was, say, six, seven months ago. I mean, even I myself was like, man, there's a recession coming from this. But I said it even six months ago that this may be a situation in which that the pain that we typically feel from a recession may not be there as like losing your job and bailing out the corporations is something that the people are really not comfortable with. If we don't experience that, like the high unemployment or the bailing out of the corporations, like the excuse that we need to, like, you know, systemically important banks or something like that. If we don't have this huge bailout thing taking place, then the people probably aren't going to be too pissed off about it. I mean, hardly anybody even understands what the bank term funding program is. And I know the average person has no clue about that. So you know it's just like yeah i mean maybe the recession was canceled i don't know <laughs> all 
All right. Uh, dental health is wise. Yes, thank you. It is. I'm coming. All right. Uh, I'm here, but just listening in a bad reception area. Well, I'm glad to see you back, old nighter, man. I'm glad to see you made it back safe. Hey, chat, what was the la latest rate ra raise? I'm guessing 25. Yeah, it was. Uh, apparently not. Okay, good evening from Lakeland, Florida. Good evening, Kevin, man. Good to see you up in here. Uh, good evening, Simon. Adding a comment and adding a like to boost the channel. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hitting that like button. Uh, when you hit the thumbs up, the YouTube algorithm will grab the video, start spreading it around for more people to join in on the chat. And it's always much funner when we have more people commenting and chatting in on the conversation. All right. Uh, just joined. How is the question serious or is it rhetorical uh, yeah um so is is recession is is the inflation over um that's kind of the question behind it a lot of people think that you know we're over the hump that inflation is coming down that we're going to be achieving the two percent target that the federal reserve is is shooting for but it's not a two percent target it's a two percent average inflation rate over time People have to understand that is part of the Fed's strategy, but a lot of people just look at this target like, boom, they're going to hit the target and that's what they're shooting for. It's not. It's a 2% average inflation rate over time. So however they achieve that, which means that they're probably going to keep the interest rates elevated for a significant amount of time and keep inflation down for a significant amount of time before they adjust interest rates again. So is inflation over? I don't think so. Like I think the idea that inflation is over with the with the money printing side of things, like you know the the quantitative tightening has taken place, the interest rates elevated, the <clears throat> putting pressure on the consumer, all that's going to continue. But there's a whole supply side that I think is going to really impact inflation going into the future that not a lot of people <clears throat> not a lot of people are considering right now. Hey, I got glasses. I can see this better. Oh, boy. No, I can't. All right. Uh, the inflation is over. The prices will be rising due to non-inflationary reasons. Um, what's a non-inflationary reason? Um, I mean, it's, I mean, there's, there's, prices are set by supply and demand. Inflation is the expansion of money and credit prices are the symptoms of it so again like i mean as prices rise due to non-inflationary pressures i'm not sure what that means i guess you know. anyway i'll figure it out all right dishes every day hello everyone dishes every day if you have a chance to go over to dishes every day's channel and hit the subscribe button we're trying to get her subscriptions up to monetize the channel she has an asmr channel going it's actually catching quite a bit of traction um you know some of the vacuuming videos are doing quite well so yeah we would really appreciate it if you go and uh and show some love over at dishes every day all right, come on, everyone. Remember to click like. 92 watchers and only 25 likes. Don't be lazy. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, definitely go hit that like button if you can. All right, we're a banana republic, sadly. Oh, getting there. Uh, they don't care about us. Yeah. Hail Nider. Yeah. All right, what does it mean that the U.S. international debt or currency was downgraded? I forget which it was. Um, I'm not sure what I would have to, I would have to read what it is that you were referring to on that. Maybe I missed something. All right. Uh, the economy won't crash. Housing market won't crash. Car prices will go down. They will offer 0% interest next year. Bitcoin will be replaced and $1 and the dollar will remain king. I mean, over the next year, I would totally agree with all that stuff. All right. Uh, let's see. XRP, XLM. Lord Humongous been a no-show in the rounds. Oh, Lord Humongous, he'll pop up again. I mean, he's a busy dude, but, you know, he's here when he can. Uh, hey, Simon, did you see the Fitch downgrading the U.S. from AAA to AA plus today? No, I missed that. But it, it's not surprising. I mean, it wasn't that, I mean, that's not the first time the Treasuries or the U.S. debt had been downgraded before, right? Um, I mean, at least, 
I was under the impression that they had like during the, the great financial crisis era during that time. But even moving from triple A down to double A, I mean, I think that's kind of significant in the idea that there is a downgrade to it, but it's still a long ways from like, say going into like junk status or something like that. Um, even considering out of all sovereign debt out there, I mean, the treasuries are still killing it, right? I mean, they're still the best sovereign debt that exists out there. Not that we want it to be, but like, I mean, would you trust Chinese bonds? Would you trust Russian bonds? Indian bonds? I mean, you'll trust the United States treasuries. I mean, everybody does. Not that you should. I'm just saying they do. You know? Um... And I really have to think, like, what is that going to do? Like, I mean, is that really going to start pushing interest rates higher because they were downgraded? Is, I mean, I guess there could be some, like, maybe issues with, you know, a certain level of grade of, of investment that you need. And that might mess with that part of it. But I don't, that seems kind of a little bit of a stretch, you know. All right. It's not over. Yeah, I don't think inflation's over. Not, not in the sense that a lot of people think it is, you know. Uh, B of A told employees hunt good loans. Hello, Simon from Carson City, Nevada. Love your channel, and I have been watching for two years now. Well, thank you always. What is it? Always be funding. All right. Well, thank you very much for the uh, comment. Inflation may be over a bit. Hyperinflation hasn't even introduced itself yet. I don't think we're going to see a hyperinflation scenario. Not until the dollar absolutely loses its world reserve currency status. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. I know a lot of people, like, they they really want to disagree with the whole idea that the BRICS nations are going to take over the United States as, as far as, like, world currency, world trade, and stuff like that. And, I mean, it might happen at some point in the future. But, I mean, we're talking, like, a long ways out in their future. I mean... How would you even prepare for that today? Like you do your, you make your move today for that, for that kind of change, like with the bricks taken over and like, you'd be waiting a long time, you know, you'd be waiting a long time for that to occur. But, you know, really like the, um, sorry guys, um, for a hyperinflation scenario to take place, Really, what you would have to have is people abandon the dollar completely. Now, getting out of the dollar completely is a very strange situation that I don't think a lot of people like really fully understand what would take place because there is more demand for dollars than people give any kind of give any kind of real credit for, and it's demand for dollars that was created outside of the United States doesn't have anything to do with the governments the corporation the banks nothing doesn't have anything to do with the United States at all in any way but these offshore dollar bonds right these are you know countries like Sri Lanka or even Turkey or you know whoever I mean these are just like countries all over the United States or all over the all over the world not just the United States who have written dollar denominated debts Right? And to get out of that debt, you need to acquire the dollars, right? You need to get the dollars and then pay off that loan, right? And say, I'm done with that. I no longer want the dollars. I don't want the, to issue out any more debts. I'm done with it. But at first, you need to get a hold of the dollars to do that. That right there, that scenario, we're going to get out of the dollar. We're no longer going to write dollar-denominated debts. That, debts are written in dollars. Those, you know, those instruments of debt, those contracts then get used as dollars. So they wrote up, I'm going to owe you $100, right? And then they use that as currency, right? So they created a dollar. They created money outside of the United States and gets used like dollars. That's a demand for liabilities out there. See, if that was to disappear, then all of a sudden there's no dollars being used or less dollars being used simply because this contract no longer exists, right? That's huge. So once all that stuff is cleared out, Right? You can imagine how much demand for dollars it's going to take just to clear that debt out. Then, once all that is done and people are no longer writing debts in dollars and no longer want these dollars, what do they do with them? Then they send them back to the United States to make some kind of use of their dollars. Right? How long does that take? That's a huge undertaking. Like, I can't even imagine to begin to fathom like what it would take to clear out all the dollar-denominated debt that exists outside of the United States. 
I, I mean, almost like an impossibility, right? So to think that it's going to end tomorrow or even the next day isn't going to happen. I mean, Turkey just sold, you know, I don't know how many billions of dollars worth of bonds to the United Arab Emirates in dollars, right? I mean, the country of Turkey. Why didn't they sell them in Russian rubles? Why didn't they sell them in yen or yuan or rupees or something other than the dollar? But no, they did it in dollars because that's the best deal that they were going to get. And that's going to be the continuing to be the case for a lot of nations out there. All right. Um, Non-inflationary reasons was a sarcastic remark on how the government was denying inflation, inflationary reasons for price increases. People have too much money and they pay more for the same stuff. Right. Well, and that's in and, and that's really like to really understand why prices go up, right? It's not just a matter of money being printed, right? I mean, if you had you could print up all this money, but if it just sits in a bank, then it doesn't do anything, right? I mean, that money actually has to be out there in circulation. And then it isn't just a matter of like the people who have first access to the money, like the rich, right? So the rich get this money and they start spending it, but that even still in itself doesn't necessarily cause inflation. What causes inflation is when everybody starts buying at the same time, when the money starts entering in at all channels at the same time, that increases consumption and the increase in consumption then lowers the available supply out there and the prices start to become you know, higher, the supply and demand imbalance. It's not just a matter of, of the rich having money. It's a matter of the, the consumption taking place from all channels at the exact same time. That's how come the stimulus worked so well during the recent rounds of quantitative easing, but didn't work so well in the quantitative easing one, two, three, and four because they didn't have those stimulus packages hand at, handed out to people to say, here, just go willy-nilly spend the money like you want. Yeah. All right. If the recession is canceled, are you concerned you that you miss the stock market bottom? No, I am not concerned about missing the stock market bottom because really I am not going to invest into the stock market in any kind of serious manner. Now, when I say that, I, I do invest in the stock market, try to do it regularly, but it's usually pretty small, like, you know, $50, $100 every week, every other week. So it's just kind of continual, you know, contributions into into the stock portfolio. But really I'm waiting for the 5 year 30 year spread to widen, all right? Cuz once you see the the inverted yield curve, you know, become steep again, start to steepen like it normally would. And you see that 5 year 30 year spread start to take place. That was Alan's Greenspan's Excuse me guys. That was Alan Greenspan's um indicator of corporate management's willingness to invest. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it sounds pretty smart that, you know, if corporate management is willing to invest, then I probably should be as well. So that's what I'm looking for is the five year, 30 year spread to widen, you know, cause that was the, that was the way he answered it when they asked him about the, the two year tenure, like the inversion, the inverted yield curve. And he says, that's a great indicator of a recession, but what he likes to follow is the five year, 30 year spread. So I'm thinking that, you know, you know when stuff is over, when you see that spread start to widen. So whether or not we enter into a recession or not, that particular part of the, of the yield curve is inverted, I believe at this moment, the five year, 30 year is. So once you see that uninvert and then you see it widen, I'm gonna start jumping in. Okay, um, cool. let's see here, inflation, Uber Eats, and okay, uh, let's see here, U.S., oh, where are my glasses, here we go, U.S. credit rating was downgraded internationally from AAA to AA, inflationary reasons, your supply constraints, or other short squeeze, purely driven by supply, uh, peace UE, well, peace to you as well. What is that? Atticus? Atticus now? <laughs> Good evening. Hyperinflation coming. Mm, I, again, like I, I have my doubts about that. If we see, I would believe a hyperinflation scenario would take place if we see the complete abandonment of the dollar, which 
I know a lot of people are saying it's happening. I don't see it in that fashion. I mean, I think there's a lot of news articles out there that say it. I think there's a lot of pinpointing, like, hey, just look here, look here, look here. And if you tell yourself that story, you can obviously see that there is a exiting, right, of, of the use of the dollar. The only problem that most people don't seem to include in, in it is that there's nothing replacing the dollar. There's not even like a distant second to, to come up and replace it. So like you can go ahead and pinpoint all the scenarios that show where the dollar is no longer being used, but yet there is no evidence of anything replacing the dollar, right? Or, and it doesn't even show where like those who are doing the international trade using their sovereign currencies, how it's benefiting them. In fact, they are finding that a lot of these nations are sitting in a position in which that they ended up with a lot of currency from a foreign nation that they don't even really want. There's nothing they can do with it except for try to sell it for dollars, right? Because, like, you know, they end up with, like, a bunch of rupees and then they don't want anything from India, right? They want, you know, something from another nation and they're like, well, we don't want rupees, we want dollars, you know, because everybody wants dollars. All right. Uh, let's see here. New vehicle upgrade, bro? No, actually. Well, it is a new vehicle to me, but it's. it was my parents' vehicle. They got some new cars. They really just didn't need this anymore. It's a 98 Ford Explorer with literally 91,000 miles on it. It's like practically new on the inside. In fact, it looks brand new on the inside. I don't think the back seat's ever been sat in. <laughs> uh um deflation is quite a ways away yeah. uh are the dice gone no they're just in the toyota so maybe i'll i'll move them over here i'll put them in the uh in the explorer here all right what will cause house prices to come down what's going to cause house prices to come down is a massive wave of unemployment that's what's going to cause house prices to come down is the is the fact that people will just simply not be able to make their payments anymore because it's not the interest rates going up that will cause a housing price to go the housing price is to go down i mean there's a lot of people who thought that i even was a bit concerned of that myself i mean you can just go back and look at my videos from about a year and a half ago when i went to go buy my house that's exactly the scenario that i was worried about was that once the interest rates go up you would see a huge drop in the housing prices or the you know the housing market prices it didn't take place like i mean some areas saw a significant downturn some areas didn't see hardly anything some places went up all right and now my particular area where i live over the last year and a half since i bought my house has significant house price increases right now since they peaked out there has been a significant drop from that peak but it's still way up from where i was at when i bought the house a year and a half ago now that's me personally for my area. I know not every area is the same and the housing, there's bunches of housing markets throughout the nation. It's not gonna be the interest rates going up, right? We already experienced that. It's not gonna be what a lot of people are saying out there with the banking crisis and all that other stuff because the banking crisis has taken place. The Federal Reserve figured out a way to send lifeboats out there with the bank term funding program. Really what it's gonna come down to is people are gonna have to stop making their payments on their house and they have to start going into foreclosure. And once you start going into foreclosure, then you're gonna start seeing the issues with prices coming down. Whether they need to short sell their house, try to get out from underneath it, or just simply go into complete foreclosure and the thing goes up to auction. The problem that I see with all this is that the inventory is so tight right now that there is a huge demand for homes and people are paying cash for these things. Like, I think it's still a third of homes right now are selling to all cash buyers. So they don't really care where interest rates are at. And they don't care if they lose their job if they own the thing outright. So there's very concerns about what, what's going to bring the housing market down. I don't see a lot, right? Coming from the home builders, right? Inventory, trying to build up, build up inventory with new construction. It's not happening, right? I mean, we did a video just on that. I mean, the building permits and starts right now are just about average to what they have been for the last 30 years or whatever it's not like there's a booming time coming to new construction where it's going to bring in this flood of new homes to the market so at this point right now unless something changes it's going to take a significant rise in unemployment and then it's going to take a couple of years for those foreclosures to bring in that wave of real estate for people to 
believe that there is actually going to be a housing market downturn. I know a lot of people will probably roll their eyes and shake their head and say, dude, you're completely wrong. It's about ready to crash from all sides. But I'm, I mean, I thought that a year and a half ago, it didn't happen, right? You know, I thought it was going to do when the moratoriums came to an end, right? I thought that was going to kick, kick, you know, house prices in, or the housing crash into gear. I thought, you know, raising of interest rates, you know, all this stuff I thought was going to do it. It didn't happen that way. But new data comes in and then it changes your, your understanding of what's going on. Let's go find that super chat. Oh, there it is. What was it? Oh, uh, Demir, thank you so much for joining the uh, membership to the channel. That's very cool, man. Uh, thank you for everybody who has joined, who has become a member of the channel. That is like very cool of you guys to support the uneducated economists in that fashion. You know, the membership, I, I know I keep promising that I'm going to help, you know, do something to to have you know, a benefit to you guys for being a member of the channel other than just giving you early access to the videos. Um, I have posted some videos just for the members only, so you know, I mean, it give you a little bit of benefit for that. But um, really, I just appreciate you guys supporting, supporting the Uneducated Economist with the memberships. I mean, it's only a dollar a month, so thank you very much for doing that. And you know, let's, let's go find the Super Chat. You guys are awesome. All right, where is that super? There it is, John. Hey, man, how you been? One ninety nine. Thank you so much. Thoughts on the U.S. downgrade of double, double? Boy, I need to really come up with some good thoughts on that one. I don't think it's as big a deal as a lot of people think it is. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe some people are you know finding it a little bit more concerning. Um, I guess I, I guess I don't at this point. Um, I mean, I almost kind of figured it was going to happen, but. Uh, Again, like, I don't think it's as significant of a deal as a lot of people would probably want it to be. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I need to, maybe I need to read up a little bit more on it. All right. Uh, doo -doo, doo -doo. He talked about it and how a politician was screwing with him tyrannically. Okay, let's see here. Did I miss something? Let me go back up here a little ways, guys. Okay. I don't understand how people are still buying homes, even with these rates. People are still consuming and using credit. How are people not discouraged in pumping the brakes? Um, well, what would... Okay. Why? Right? Like, why would people, like, be pumping the brakes? Unless you are like, I mean, we're, we're like hyper focused in on the economy. So we see like a lot differently than what most people do. Most people are pretty blind to the economy, right? So if they have a job, that's, that's probably their indicator of whether or not they are going to continue on with their life in the same fashion. Or if they decide that they're going to start tightening up the belt, so to speak. But if they have a job or they feel like they have access to a job, their concern level drops dramatically. Right? But if, you, if you're in worried, like worried about getting laid off and then there's massive unemployment taking place out there, then your concern gets very elevated. Again, it's all about the story you tell yourself, right? So if the story you tell yourself is like, I'm not concerned about my job and I'm not concerned about getting another job, then you're probably not concerned about your pay and you're not worried about what's going to happen into the future. Like w us who are focused in on the economy, it doesn't matter how much money we make. Like we can have a, you know, $10,000, you know, come in in a single day. We still understand and focus in on the problems that we see coming into the future due to the slowdown, to the, you know, lack of manufacturing, due to the interest rates increases and stuff like that. But most people don't look at it like that and so therefore they don't incorporate that into their strategy and it's not part of the story they tell themselves they really just sit back go everything's gonna be fine everything's fine everything's fine everything's fine right and that's what they tell themselves <laughs> and i laugh at that when i see people do that but really that's really what it comes down to is that people just don't know to be scared and so they don't and unless the news tells them that they have to go be scared then they won't be you know and if they don't understand what's going on, then they just won't pay attention to it. All right. Uh, the USD lost 13% compared to Brazilian real between January and now. You could buy 
548 reels for 100 USD January. Now it's 479. Big difference. Yeah, I mean, Mexico has some pretty strong peso going on right now. Calling it the super peso or whatever. <coughs> Give it time. I mean, it's just, it's, that isn't going to last forever. And you'll see that switch too. Loans, loans back the dollar and banks continue to hand out loans so the one or the dollar will remain king for the next 50 years. Yeah, I, I don't know about 50 years, but I, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be for some time. I mean, again, like I don't see anything that even comes remotely close to doing what the dollar can do. And a lot of people, like, I had somebody say, what is it the dollar can do that, like, you know, something else can't? It's literally, it's not the dollar itself. It's the U.S. Treasuries. That's what really does it. And when you have, like, like, you have your, you know, this is where, what it comes down to. Because, like, the U.S. Treasuries is essentially the world reserve currency, right? It's not the dollar. Like, the, I mean, people like having dollars because it can pay off debts and it can do other stuff. But holding a dollar is really costly. Right. Not only do you lose money or lose purchasing power due to the inflation, deteriorating dollar purchasing power, stuff like that. But then it also costs money to transfer dollars, to secure dollars, to hold dollars. Right. And so much like gold, dollars are somewhat of a burden for international trade. Right. Because like even with gold, you know, you got security issues, transportation issues, you know, storage, whatever. You got these issues that go along with it. When you have treasuries, you have something that's actually paying you an interest to hold it, right? So unlike dollars that don't pay an interest and actually cost you to hold it or to send it or whatever, treasuries pay you a little bit of interest. So it's even better than gold, right? In that sense, that holding onto this treasury is going to have an interest payment to it. So now this treasury can be used for international trade as well much like the dollar or even gold can. But with the treasury, people are accepting something that also pays an interest to them. So it's a nice benefit for both parties to use U.S. treasuries for it. Now, if there was another bond out there, like, you know, Chinese bonds or something like that, it would do ex essentially the same thing, right, that the U.S. treasuries can do. The only difference is, is that people know that the U.S. Treasury is going to get paid, even though we have this downgrade, right? You know, AAA down to AA plus or whatever. The chances of you taking on a belief that the Chinese bond is going to pay out before the U.S. Treasury will isn't exactly like a truthful statement. Like, I mean, some people might believe that, but the reality of the situation is that it's not nearly as likely. You're taking on more risk buying into Chinese bonds or any bond out there outside of the U.S. Treasury, right? U.S. Treasuries have never failed, never will fail, right? I mean, they've asked for that, you know, the U.S. Treasury has zero chance of default because they have the printing press to back it up. The only problem with it is, is that they can't guarantee the purchasing power of the dollar. So again, like, whether it's dollars or gold, they still don't beat treasuries. And as far as treasuries go, there's nothing else out there. There's nothing else out there that has the confidence of U.S. treasuries backing it. Will that all last? No. I mean, all of that will eventually fade away and be gone and it'll be something else taking its place. But there's nothing there backing it, you know, to, to, to knock it off its pedestal, right? I mean, literally nothing. <laughs> And I don't like it. I mean, I don't like that idea. I wish everybody would start dealing in gold or Bitcoin or something like that. But, you know, I mean, what I want and what is the reality of the situation are two very different things. All right. It was once said that the world currency is like a hamper full of dirty towels, but the U.S. is the cleanest of the dirtiest towels. That's exactly right. That is exactly right of it, you know. All right. Good point. Michael Dahl is crashing against Brazilian currency, I think. Same for Mexico, the peso is going, going value, yeah. If someone says inflation has gone down, I'd ask, has their food, energy, and housing costs gone? Right. And now, and that's another thing, like, when I said it, that inflation was going to come down, I said minus food and fuel, 
right? Those are the two things that are, are not going to come down in the same fashion. But luxury items, like all the toys, all the fancy stupid things that people buy out there, those things are going to going to come down in price and you're starting to see that happening i mean just take a look at like rolex the luxury rolex market is crashing dramatically and you see good evidence of it happening over in china which would make a lot of sense because china never really had like a booming luxury market i mean they always had rich people there but for the most part everybody else was poor but their standard of living really started to increase, especially over the last 10, 20 years, as the manufacturing powerhouse of the world brought in new money coming into their, into their people. What happens when you get new money, right? You want to enjoy a better standard of living, which means that you start moving into luxuries, which means that what happens, right? You elevate that standard of living, you cut off the new money, and people start falling into poverty. I mean, this is the same thing that happens over and over again, and you're seeing it taking place in real time right now in China. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you for the comment, Matt. All right. Two all nighters. Sorry to ask again, but I had to take care of something in the Dion live stream. I didn't get a chance to read your response about George Gammon. Uh, would you say, to a certain extent, inflation is part of greed? No. I mean, I wouldn't, because I mean. I think that a greedy person could take advantage of an inflationary scenario. Like, I, I think that can happen, right? So, like, somebody who recognizes the situation, knows where to position themselves, can be very greedy about what's happening and take massive advantage of that. So, do I think that takes place? Absolutely. But I don't think inflation is caused by greed. I think inflation is a natural occurring economic condition that happens when you have an increase in consumption, right? Once, once consumption increases, then you'll start having prices move up because in consumption takes the supply out, right? Demand increases, supply falls, prices go up. It's just, it, it, it isn't necessarily a greed thing. Now, is greed, like going into luxuries, is that greed? Is that greedy behavior? I mean, people work damn hard for their money. They don't want to sit around being poor their entire life. They want to enjoy that money, right? They want to drive a nicer car. They want to wear nicer clothes. They want to live in a better house, you know, eat better food. This is not, this is not something that is like, you know, your greedy, evil person for wanting to enjoy the fruits of your labor, right? That's not, that's not a greedy person doing that. The problem with it is, is that the, the act of moving into those luxuries is what eventually drives the situation in which when the new money pours off or turns off, everybody falls into poverty. So if we didn't dive into luxuries to begin with, if we chose somehow to not enjoy all the fruits of our labor, but to just continue on living the humble life that we probably were in before we got the new money, right? Then things would probably not be as painful as the, as we experience, but that's not going to happen. It doesn't work like that. Like, Human nature does not allow that to take place, right? You have to make a conscious effort that I am not going to spend this money on luxury items. Who does that? Nobody. Everybody buys something nice, right? I mean, because you want to enjoy it. There's no, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying that's what that's the reason why you have a rise and fall in you know, the economy with the people going into poverty and stuff. Okay, 211 of you up in here, man. That is so awesome. Thank you for being here. Go hit that like button, everybody. We'll get more people up in here with that. Uh, if you hit the like button, the algorithm will spread the video around more. All right. Hey, Matt, he talked about it and how the politician was screwing. Oh, we already did that one. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if he slipped off a cliff or if it was climbing. <laughs> no shoes, no shirt, no dice. Learn it, know it, live it. <laughs> All right. He was fight, hiking and found himself in a situation of possibly falling off the cliff. After yelling for help, someone came to his rescue. He had paid them later to find out they needed the currency. Huh. Life hack for clean teeth. Floss first, then brush your teeth with baking soda. Then chew a slice of lemon. Your teeth will fizz really bad and the lemon hit the baking soda. It cleans well. Yeah, I, I assure you, my teeth are never going to get that bad again. So, <laughs> uh, I highly recommend watching that live stream from Sunday on the Rebel Capitalist channel. I see George George's fire a little clearer now. 
Huh, must have been a good one. Well, yeah, let's go check out George Gammon's Rebel Capitalist channel from Sunday and see uh, see what All Nighter is talking about there. All right. Uh, Utah National Park can be pretty dangerous. Angel's Landing was never racking. Brush your teeth, hydrogen peroxide to rinse out the lemon fizz. <laughs> Uh, uh, homeowner association fees are also up massively as well. My neighborhood went from four fifty a month to six ten, just for your HOA. Oh my gosh! Wow. Damn, that's a lot. I don't know. Maybe it's not. I don't know, it seems like a lot. All right. If you do this once a week, the dentist can't compete with the results. Oh, well, good to know. <laughs> I'm curious, why would my 401k and IRA be up right now? I expected it to be down. Yeah, and I mean, I know my portfolio is up pretty well as, you know, right now, you know, the same. Um, again, like, I guess you could probably go into a lot of, um, you know, theories and stuff like that. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of places that you can go to that you can secure your wealth, right? Like, you know, if you're worried about treasuries going down in price, right? Or if you're worried about, you know, stock market going down, a real estate market going down, a gold going down, you know, you have to find your safe haven on where it is that you want to be. And at the same time, you have, like, so the, normally if people are worried about something like that, they'll get into cash, right? So they'll just sit in cash and wait for wait for the things to change around. But if you're worried about everything out there, including cash, where is it you're gonna go, right? Really, you know, that leaves just a handful of places and that's probably one of the reasons why the stock market and real estate market is doing as well as they are, is just simply because the narrative out there is stay out of cash, right? Don't go into cash. Well, if you don't go into cash, then you gotta go somewhere. Right. And that's in that's probably another reason why we may not even be seeing the recession as well is because people didn't cash out of the stock market thinking that getting into cash was a dumb idea. So it is left it in the stock market. I don't know. There's a lot of theories on what could be happening out there. All right. Uh, nope. A good dentist could pull all your teeth faster than a week. All right. I rewinded. I'm watching from the beginning at negative 26 minutes. <laughs> All right, I've got to see it, man. Very, very wide. Proof, okay. Let's see. You guys are all talking to each other, okay? I mixed elephant turds and tap water. <laughs> all right. Uh, here we go. Oh, no message. CA sent six ninety nine. I guess that's Canadian, but there's no. No message, you redacted it. Okay. Uh, thanks, Phil. You make need to try another device. Some devices hide the button because technology. All right. From the Northeast. Hello from the Northeast. Well, hello, 345 Farm. All right. Good money versus bad money. Yeah, see, that's another thing. Like, you know, if you think about it, like the, the whole like good money versus bad money and, uh, and what ends up happening from, from when you have two currencies at play, right? And generally what you will end up finding out there is that if you have two currencies in the economy that are being used at the exact same time, the good money will disappear, right? And the bad money will be the only one left. So to me, when I even hear about the BRICS nations and de-dollarization and getting out of the dollar. When you have two currencies in situ in the in use, right, and one of them is disappearing and the other one's coming in and being used, the one that's being used is the bad currency, and the one that's disappearing is the good currency. Right? Think about that. So all the more that people are using things that are outside the dollar. That's just showing more that the dollar is the good currency, 
and they're trying to hold on to that. In fact, there's an article there that the Chinese, what was the Chinese bank authorities or whatever, are telling their banks to please not buy dollars right now. Right? They're telling them, please, please don't do that right now. We're trying to keep the yuan from from sinking any further. Right? So, it's a demand for dollars out there. There's a huge demand for it. And there's in when I hear like here, let's do a currency, let's do a deal outside of the dollars. It's because they would rather hold on to their dollars and use another currency. Right? Bad currency, bad money. Uh, Oh, a new truck. No, it's not. Well, it's new to me. It's my, it's my 98 Ford Explorer with 91,000 miles on it. My parents gave it to me because they didn't need it any longer. They got some new vehicles and it was just one that they were just using just to haul stuff around. And then they just said, hey, we just don't need this car anymore. So, and I said, cool, I'll take it. Everybody keep missing the mark on how do you know it's real time to be scared or not to be or or not or don't the bible say don't worry about tomorrow troubles today will have enough of its own how how do you okay well again like you know the only reason why you're scared is because of the story that you're telling yourself right you know you look out there and you you can come up with all the scary scenarios of everything that you could ever possibly imagine you know death of the dollar Losing my job, house prices going down, stock market crash. You can put all these things into your belief system, right? And you can say, man, I have got to be concerned about this. I got to set myself up to deal with the consequences of these, of these possibilities that are coming into the future. And now, how do I deal with that? Well, I got to find the evidence of it taking place, right? Because if there's a stock market crash, if there's a housing market crash, if there's some sort of crash out there and I need to protect myself from it, then I need to find the evidence of that taking place so that I know that I can position myself to avoid those sort of things that are happening out there. So if I have a belief that it's taken place, then I could go out there and start finding the information that definitely confirms my belief. And then you'll sit there paranoid and scared looking at all this data, all this information, wondering what it is that you're supposed to do because you have this idea that there's going to be this crashing housing market, stock market, everything else that's coming into you, into existence, right? And so if that's what's in your field of view, right? And that's the evidence that you have put out there, that's exactly the story that you see. That's what that's like basically you've tunnel visioned yourself to 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 see that. And then a lot of people out there would be dude, you're you're delusional, you shake, you know, shaking their head saying, "Man, you're delusional." You're just choosing not to see it. No. I mean, I see it just the same as everybody else does. What I have not done is taken on the belief to the point that it is now set to a convinced. Right? Is it a possibility? Sure. Is there evidence of it? Yeah. But I'm not taking the evidence to such an extreme that I am convinced that it's going to happen. Instead, what I have done is I try to look at things as a possibility coming into the future. And the evidence that I do find is just a possibility, right? If it's set in stone, then it makes it very difficult to see anything outside of that particular view. Right? So if you want to see how the world is crashing around you, you will find evidence of it. And you will definitely create a view of, a view of that and have a very you know, strong, convinced belief of it all. But you don't have to see it that way. You, know, you, you can really see it any way you want to. And if you want to see it in a fashion that says, hey, I got opportunity coming to me and I'm going to find the opportunities that are coming, even though there's, you know, a lot of concerns and unknowns that are happening, I'm going to be best positioned myself to deal with these changes and concerns that are happening. And it's not scary, right? Because if it is scary, then you can make it scary, you know, but to me, it's more exciting, good opportunities, you know, possibilities. All right. I just want to support the channel. Well, thank you very much, Phil. And it's very cool of you. If that's the case. All right, good stuff. One in five of us can still afford homes. I see the same houses on the market. Sellers refuse to lower their price. 
Well, I don't know about necessarily refusing to lower the price. I mean, I remember houses used to sit on the market for months, years, right? I mean, that was the case. It wasn't something that you put on the market and sold like that. That was, that's, a, that's only something that's only occurred over the last few years. I mean, that isn't the case. Like, I mean, typical housing market would have price discovery taking place, you know, people come and check out the house, they get, you know, and they hear what the offer is, they put in their own offer, you know, whatever, you kind of go back and forth on it, you do it to several houses, that's the way a typical housing market would work, right, you know, you got to shop for it, you got to work it a little bit, the idea that, you know, you can put a house out there and sell it the next day, that's, that was ridiculous, that's not the way it's supposed to work, you know, so sitting out there for months or sitting out there a long time, is it really a long time or is it just longer than what we're used to? You know, that's, that's really the question we should ask. All right. Okay. Nobody can afford one. Nobody can afford one in five. Okay. Inflation has barely started. Yeah. At this rate, I wouldn't be surprised if we see 8% mortgage rates. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised at that either, but does do people really end up paying 8% mortgages? Like, you know, there's a lot of times that we're finding that mortgages are being, you know, are bought down. Um, that the actual mortgage that they're taking out is not at 8%, but, you know, maybe at like 5 or 6%. And, you know, for the next couple of years until they can refinance going into the future. Um, are mortgage rates going to continue to go up from here? I mean, I have to question that. You know, the Federal Reserve did, you know, raise interest rates just recently. And they did promise that they will raise them again at some point in the future. But how much farther are they really going to go? And is that really going to be pushing mortgage rates up further? I mean, you know, we've kind of talked about this one in the past and how when the Federal Reserve initiated the right raising of interest rates, it shot mortgage rates shot up like right away. Like they they took off like say, OK, well, the Fed's raising rates and it shot up to like 8 percent right away, you know, back in what was it, October of whatever it was. But then they plateaued out. Right. And the Federal Reserve continued to raise rates. They kept raising the Fed funds rate, but the mortgage rates, I mean, although they would fluctuate a little bit off of the Fed's news and every time they raise rates, it would pop up a little bit. But for the most part, they stayed considerably flat for the last, you know, six, seven, eight, nine months or whatever it's been. So even if the Federal Reserve does raise rates going into the future, I do wonder if it's actually going to raise the mortgage rates. And more likely what I kind of see happening is that people are going to see that the Federal Reserve has peaked out on its on its interest rates and that's going to encourage them to have this idea that a reversal in the interest rates are going to start you know taking place and that the the mortgage rates could come down and the idea of refinancing into the future would be more of the game right so even though we have high interest rates on the mortgages at like say eight percent if the Federal Reserve puts out the narrative or puts out the signal or the credible threat that they are going to be lowering interest rates into the future, that would encourage a lot of buyers to even jump in, even if the mortgage rates are high, just with the idea that, hey, I can refinance this thing going into the future, no worries at this point. So again, that would support the, the, the housing market if that was to take place in something like that. You know, again, we'll have to see how it plays out though. Okay. I mean, I have a steady job and big income bi-weekly, but my spending has not increased as far as luxury living. Just my basic needs. No vacation, no nothing. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, it's the case for a lot of people. So, I mean, but, you know, you have a full-time job with a decent income, right? I mean, I know, like, you know, for me... I have a decent job and it's an okay income, but for the area that I live in, it's pretty difficult, right? So I can't do it just off of my day job. Like I have to have other forms of income and I do. Like I, you know, do YouTube videos. I call bingo on the weekends. I will go and, you know, do some side work, you know, with, with people if I'm offered. I mean, not lately, but there was a time that I used to do like, you know, say construction jobs or something like that on my days off just to, you know, make a few extra dollars on my, on my, on my weekends but there was never a time in my life in which that my job paid the bill like I mean it would pay my bills but it wouldn't provide me with any kind of decent life like if I wanted anything beyond my bills like my house and my 
my bills being paid. I had to go and find side jobs, find side gigs and, and do it that way. I mean, the con the, because it's so easy to make money now, a full-time job isn't going to cut it because people with full-time jobs have ex have other income, have extra side gigs, have you know stuff that's going on. And with your full-time job in these extra side gigs, then you can have like, you can pay the rent easier, you can go and buy the groceries easier and stuff like that. So the more people who do that, it'll start driving the standard of living up because it's not just a full-time job that everybody has. Everybody has a full-time job plus some side gigs. So if you just have your full-time job, it won't be enough, right? It's just not, it's just not going to be enough. You have to have a side gig to go with it because everybody else has side gigs as well. Does that kind of make sense with it? It's like, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not really hard to make it in this, in this country. I mean, just about anybody can make it. It's hard to make it good. That's the problem that a lot of people end up facing is that they want politicians or society or something to make their life good. And that's, that's not the way it works. You know, I mean, you, it's, you know, nobody makes your life good. Only you make your life good. But, you know, the way this, you know, the way the system and society and everything's set up, it doesn't, it doesn't take any kind of real skill or talent or anything to make it right. I mean, it's, it's, but it does take a lot of skill and talent and hard work to make it good. And that's the major difference I think people need to understand. You know, it's just that it's not hard to, to, to earn money. It's all over the place. It's just hard to make it good. All right. Do you want to lower the price so you don't have a listing fees, property taxes, maintenance, market going to go down your seller, your, the sucker if you can't sell? Huh. Missed the blue dye. Well, I'll get the dye up in here then. Uh Hey, you're awesome. Okay, we have the world reserve currency and the reserve asset in treasuries. And that's it. Like, I mean, you know, just like old Nider saying there, like, what's going to replace that? Like, if you have, I mean, you know, go ahead and invent something. Like, you know, I mean, even if the BRICS was to, hey, we got this new currency, everybody use our new currency. Well, you have to get the trust, right? I mean, Brazil, sure, they're, I mean, the re, their currency is, you know, doing really well right now. Do you want to trust Brazil that they're going to pay all their debts to provide the world with a safe and liquid asset like the U.S. Treasuries? I mean, no. You know, nobody's going to trust Brazil. I mean, some people might, but you know, the world ain't going to trust Brazil. Besides, how are they going to protect the, slip, the shipping channels, right? They're going to have to rely on the United States to protect the shipping channels. So, again, nobody's going to use their real, you know, use Brazil's treasuries for, for world user currency. All right. Oh, the sector's already... Bought out of fear of missing out. Uh, you know, and that's the thing. You, you know, calling people suckers because they bought for the fear of missing out while they're sitting there in a house while everybody else is struggling to figure out why it is they're going to buy a house, right? I mean, that's not the fear of missing out, right? The fear of missing out is when you panic buy, right? That's when, that's when the fear of missing out takes place. Not when people are looking for a place to live and they can afford it. That's that's a very different different situation. There could be and probably is many people who did buy at a FOMO, but for the most part, the people who can afford houses right now are pretty wealthy people who are probably not terribly concerned about missing out. I think poor people are in fear of missing out. Right, major difference. All right. I promise to get off my ass and send some more fuzzy dice. <laughs> now, I'll get the dice. I'll get them hung up in here. They're just in the Toyota. All right. If you bought two years ago and sold now, you make 20% profit. No sucker there. That's it. I mean, I could sell my house right now. I could even market $50,000 $50, under the Zillow estimate and still come out with a profit. It's just, you know. Uh... UK guilt never defaulted either. Yeah, and I mean, and you think about it, like, you know, n the European nations or the Euro would be, like, a runner-up, right? I mean, they're a distant second, like, way out there. But, you know, if there was a runner-up, it would be out of that out of that continent, right? <laughs> you know, out of the Euro nations. 
in terms of companies still worth investing in, would you say to stick with more necessities, essentials, compared to things like tech that seem inflated? Um, I am not the type of person you want to ask about investment advice because I have no idea on whether or not a stock in a company is the right thing to choose based on their numbers or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of YouTubers out there. There's a lot of investors out there who can really explain that very well. Like if you want to invest in the stock market and know whether or not this company or a particular company is the right choice, there's people out there who can give you formulas and stuff like that that'll tell you exactly whether or not it's a good idea. Me personally, there's only one stock that I really buy. It's Altria, right? Marlboro cigarettes, Anheuser-Busch, right? Tobacco and alcohol. I don't smoke and I don't drink, but I used to be fairly addicted to both, right? So I know a little bit about addiction. I don't think that beer and cigarettes are going to go away. Like, I don't care what laws you make or whatever. That's The tobacco industry is far too big, too many lobbyists, and beer will be consumed till the end of time, right? I mean, that's like those two things I just feel are going to be fairly consistent. During a recession, if there is a recession, downturns, usually beer and cigarettes do fairly well. People would rather drink and smoke at home and be depressed than to, you know, spend their money on things that are like more reasonable and, and beneficial to their life. So me personally, that's the one that I go to, right? Is is alcohol and tobacco. And you know, I don't nothing to do. I don't know if that's the right move or not, but that's what I do. Uh, world economy is 100 trillion. All gold is less than 10 trillion. Not enough gold to go around. Um, yeah, I mean, I can believe that, but that's due to the dollar denominated debt that's existing. I think there's enough gold. It's just a matter of how much gold do you plan on use, using in actual commerce, right? Because you could take all the gold, put it in a third party, create a digital token representing the gold in the vault and then separate that digital token into as many fractions as you want and so therefore any amount of gold would be enough right uh, if you if you were to tokenize it um in, in 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 that sense so there's plenty of gold to to be used as a world reserve currency that's not the problem right the problem would occur is is that the most industrious nations out there would be able to export their products, import the gold, and then deprive the rest of the world of gold until they got to a point in which that they had all the gold started moving into luxuries. When they start moving into luxuries, they start bringing in the foreign imports, start driving out their domestic manufacturing, and eventually fall into poverty themselves once the new money turns off, right? So this is the case that happens throughout many economies throughout economic history, right? A, a secure or a set amount of currency will deprive some nations and benefit others until it collapses and redistributes out again. So it's not a matter of how much gold is in the system. It's the way that the gold concentrates into just a few hands during a gold standard, right? It creates these boom and bust cycles of like boom and bust business cycles where, you know, and people are like in the money, just loving it. And all of a sudden it just ends, right? Because there's not enough commerce going on out there because of the lack of gold due to the concentration of wealth that had taken place when the booming times were happening. Once the boom is over, people's businesses fail and crash or whatever, that redistribution of gold goes back out there and the whole thing starts over again. So it's, it's like, I mean, I'm a, I'm a believer in the gold standard. Like I understand what happens, you know, I understand how commerce would work and all that other stuff. And I, I see the business cycles that would happen from it. So, you know, you can prepare, right? During the good times, you prepare for the bad times and that way you can, you know, at least have something during those, during those bad times. Most people would not be able to operate in that system. Like they would not understand that during the good times, don't dive into luxuries, but hold on to that money because you know there's going to be some bad times coming when the business cycle turns. Most people wouldn't do that. They would just, you know, just ride it out, you know, spending all their money. And then once the business cycle turned, they would all be in poverty, right? lose it all and go into default and bankruptcies and stuff like that. 
So, I mean, I'm down for the gold standard, but I don't think anybody else is going to handle it well. <laughs> uh, will Brazil offer BBL to member nations? Couldn't tell you. Wish I had a hundred trillion. Oh, yeah. It's not over for me. Yeah. What do you think of Fitch downgrade? You know, I mean, people keep asking me about that. I think, I mean, to be honest with you, I think it's less of a d big deal than a lot of people are probably going to make it out to be. I mean, I think it's an issue. I think it's probably going to create some issues out there. But as far as like, you know, major issues, like changing the entire like economic scenery out there, I don't think that's going to happen. Rolex, a.k.a. Rob me, yeah. I came here to get rich quick, talk faster. <laughs> China's wages grew 15 times over, but economy only grew four times over. Right? And that's, you know, and that's just the case. Like, you know, I mean, you think about it. Their new money came in from the manufacturing of stuff, right? They're a manufacturing powerhouse. So they export all this stuff and they bring new money in. That's how, you know, that's how a lot of economies worked, especially throughout history. The United States did that too. But when we got to the point where we started exporting, you know, when we were exporting our manufacturing, bringing in new money, and then we started moving into luxury, started bringing in the foreign imports, that's really where the situ situation really took it to the point of critical, right? Because we were going to get to a point in which that we export all our manufacturing and importing nothing but foreign production, we were going to export all our gold. That's why Nixon ex severed the gold standard. He says, we can't do this. We're going to end that whole system. And now, instead of like exporting manufactured goods for new money, we're going to export U.S. treasuries. We're going to sell debt. And that's how we get our new money in. So it used to be from the manufacturing of all the world's best products. And, you know, because you think about it, American made was awesome, right? Once that came to an end, now it's just the U.S. Treasury debts that we, you know, the U.S. Treasuries that we issue out there to bring that new money in. So our standard of living continues. We end up with a huge separation between the rich and the poor, which is going to continue to grow worse. In places like China, they suffer because when the manufacturing slows down, they can't just go and issue out a bunch of debt like the United States did. Right, because people don't really want Chinese debt. I mean, some people probably do, but for the most part, if China is starting to stumble a little bit, you'd be a little bit concerned about whether or not you're going to get paid back on that bond, right? And so now China has to suffer with the fact that they just don't get new money coming in due to their manufacturing slowdown, right? The United States, we could just issue out a bunch of debt. We don't have to worry about that, you know? and we do, and we issue out debt, and we don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean. We should worry about it, but we don't. All right. Uh, infamous NYC. It's great to see you here. 100 typed into a computer. 10 trillion dug out of the ground. <laughs> All right. So those with gold would hoard it and get rich. Others will go poor. Well, get rich in what sense? Like you'd have to give up your, your gold at some point, and then you wouldn't be rich on gold anymore. You'd be rich on what? Luxury items? All right. I mean, uh, Rolexes purchased at manufacturer suggested retail price still do well. Hello, millionaires, multimillionaires, and future millionaires. <laughs> I like that one. Hi, Simon. Hey, wandering doc. All right. TP shortages of 2020. Yeah. And, you know, that's not the first time. Like, I mean, I did a video on toilet paper shortages long before COVID and all that other stuff. I had done a video talking about a toilet paper shortage that had happened back in the 70s. Like, I think it was in the late 70s. And where um, Johnny Carson had made a joke on his, on his show saying that there's going to be a toilet paper or there's a toilet paper shortage. And it was all from this blown up story. Like they just took this story and blew it out of proportion about like, I think it was some Wisconsin representative or something wanting to like, you know, increase the fiber market or something for his area. So he was kind of putting out this idea that, that toilet paper manufacturers are going to be cut short on the fiber that they need to make toilet paper and that there was going to be this toilet paper shortage. And so Johnny Carson 
was joking around about this, right? And he tried to put out, you know, a few late night jokes, you know, to entertain his crowd with. Well, it caught like wildfire and people were like, holy shit, there's going to be this toilet paper shortage, right? And so they all ran out and started buying up toilet paper. There was never a toilet paper shortage. Like the manufacturers never had a shortage. There was never any like issue with manufacturing. Like it was literally panic buying for a long time. It was like an entire year. Like people would not like get their senses about them. They were like hoarding onto toilet paper. People would tell these stories about how like, you know, their dad had like, you know, cases of toilet paper stacked behind the sofa or in the closet or under the beds or whatever. Everybody was like hoarding up on this toilet paper. And it wasn't that there was a shortage of toilet paper. Like there was plenty of it. It was just sitting in everybody's living rooms and sitting in their, you know, garages or whatever. Instead of just going and buying a normal amount, they just like basically panic bought and cleared out the shelves. Well, once you have that sort of situation going on, the people who don't have toilet paper are going to end up paying a lot of money for it, right? Because they want the toilet paper. And so, like, you know, there was people out there, like, totally gouging it right? and saying, yeah, I'll sell you a roll of toilet paper for, like, 10 bucks or something like that. I mean, all this was taking place, but it literally came from a rumor that started the whole thing. Right? There was never any toilet paper shortage. It was just people believe that there was and and started taking action to try and you know secure their toilet paper and it just literally deprived the entire country of toilet paper for a while um, lemon will erode the enamel oh that's interesting all right hey that dude over there oh two thank you very much for the four canadian man very cool of you do you think the u.s will ever be able to pay the national debt no never never will they pay the national debt uh, would that would that be with increased production or higher taxes? Okay, they will never pay the national debt off. Like never. The only way you can deal with the national debt is by two ways: cutting government or increasing taxes. That's it. That's the only way you can really deal with it. So people don't like it when you cut government, you know, government services, you know, entitlement programs, whatever that is, right? All the all the stuff. So people don't like it when you cut government. People love it when you tax the corporations, but when you end up taxing the corporations, that's just another fee that goes into the product of whoever is purchasing it. So really, that's a burden on the consumer in the end of it. It doesn't really, they don't really, you know, they don't really tax the corporations. I mean, they say they do, but that's just another payment to the to the people. So that's really what would end up happening. Um, there, there's, there will be talk of it, in the, in the idea that, you know, hey, we're trying to do something about this. And that will encourage a lot of people. Like, they will see, like, some sort some sort of action being done to try and, and deal with this overwhelming debt that's happening. But it's it's going to be superficial for the most part. Because there's really nothing that they can do to, to actually wipe out that debt. But you're going to see some, some differences. Like, at the beginning of the year, in 2024, at the beginning of the next year... Um, and it's hard to see it right now because the Treasury is just issuing out debt like crazy. But they're going to get to a point in which that they are going to reverse their debt issuance and they're going to go into debt buybacks. The Treasury will literally be buying back their own Treasuries off the market. And that's going to be due to a, a liquidity issue, right? So as the dollars are being sucked out of the economy from the Federal Reserve monetary tightening, that's going to start creating liquidity issues in the world, right? We're already starting to see them happen in, in various places. But as the attempt to try and acquire the dollars becomes very difficult, people are going to start selling their assets off, right? And one of the easiest ways to acquire dollars is by selling treasuries because treasuries are incredibly liquid. Now, if there ever comes a situation in which that somebody goes to sell their treasury and they can't find a buyer, that's going to be very dangerous for the treasuries, right? Because then you're going to end up with like price, like in interest rates on those or the yields like shooting up or how do I say it? Prices falling on those particular items, yield shooting up. Disruptions within the treasury market are not something that is going to be taken very lightly. The whole idea that people are encouraged by the treasury market is the fact that they are quickly liquidated. 
right? That you can sell them right now. And if there came a situation in which that wasn't the case and that you couldn't sell them like right now, again, that would start creating some very panicky situations in which people would be like, oh crap, I need to get out of the treasuries themselves. Interest rates would really start shooting up and stuff. They're not gonna allow that to happen. When I mean they aren't, the treasury itself is not going to allow that to happen. If there is a moment in time in which that somebody comes to market and says, I wanna sell this treasury and they can't find a buyer, the treasury is gonna jump in there and buy it, just like that, right? They are gonna be on the ball with the liquidity, ready to make sure that that, market's, that particular market stays, stays liquid, right? And now, again, that's really difficult for people to see coming into the future, but that's what's gonna end up happening. And right now, you got the treasury loading up on cash, right? I mean, like, I don't even know what the treasury general account is up to, but it's like exceeding what they would typically be if you were to take out like the COVID era, you know, type of thing. That treasury general account where the cash that they hold at the Federal Reserve is now quite elevated and they plan on taking it up to like a trillion dollars. And the only reason why I would think that they would do it is not so they can pay their bills, it's so that they can keep the treasury market liquid. And right now they're getting in, they're getting prepared for it. I don't know if I said all that accurately, but anyway. you guys, I think you get my point. <laughs> all right. Um, where are we at here? HOA work of the devil. Okay, baking soda is fine. Okay. Uh, one of my condos in Hawaii I bought for... In 2011, HOA fees up from 375 to 850. Oh, but rents are up from 22 to 3,000. And my mortgage PITI is 105, so a thousand monthly cash flow. No, well, there's that, right? I mean, it's all about the yield, right? What and when it whatever you end up with at the end of the month, I guess. I'm new to your podcast. It's cool. Well, thank you, Philip, man. I'm glad you're here. We've been doing this since 2017, if you can believe that. Man, has it really been that long? Yeah, since November of 2017. All right, NASDAQ up, S&P up, Dow up. All right, precious metals are being suppressed. Gold should be at 5,000. Yeah, and that's another thing. Like, you know, how long do you want to wait to till they lose their, you know, their, you know, their suppression scheme you know they that that is something that i have been following for a very long time i mean the silver short position like i remember reading about that back in like you know when i first started getting into silver like back in 2007 8 you know and it would been happening for years before that like how long is it going to continue? Like I've been waiting twelve years for the for the suppression, you know, for the the whole manipulation scheme to come to an end, but it doesn't happen, right? It just continues onward. Again, I'm a believer in precious metals, but as far as like buying in, waiting for that time in which that the you know the the manipulation comes to an end and metals go to their real price, I I don't know. I mean, you'd be waiting a long time, I think, because I've been waiting a long time. And I'm not even really waiting anymore. I just don't even care. Like it's not that's not part of my strategy. You know? All right. I only have a few rentals, but I prefer condos because you outsource capex repairs by simply paying the HOA fees. Yeah, that's interesting. I've been looking to buy my first condo. Ryan, what's up, brother? All right, seems to make sense. Less fees and less repairs. My father taught me handy skills and how to paint a house so I can take some of the work off. Fitch downgrade. Man, everybody wants to talk about the Fitch downgrade. I mean, again, like, I mean, I find it to be a big deal, but not as big of a deal as what I think a lot of people are going to be making it out to be. Um, yeah. I don't know. Does anybody know when was the last time that the U.S. you know government bonds were downgraded? I, I think it happened back in the during the financial crisis, didn't it? Like during the Great Financial Crisis. Hey Simon, my dentist, also a lifelong friend from high school, told me only floss the teeth you want to keep. Interesting. All right, buddy. Hider, where in Alaska were you fishing? All right. 
Have you considered trying short form videos like YouTube Shorts, Facebook, Instagram Reels, or TikTok to grow your channel? I've seen people blow up in a few days from YouTube Shorts. Yeah, I have. Um, and, you know, I put out a few YouTube Shorts before, but I, I mean, I don't know... Like, I got to get into the to the idea of what a short should be, you know? Like, I know there's, like, little clips that you can put together that might, you know, suggest a, a video, like, a, a, like, good content for a video, you know, or something. But I, I have a hard time, like, kind of understanding, like, what a one-minute video would be that's informative, that would be, you know, something useful. I think it could be an attention getter for my other videos. So that might be kind of cool, but um, I have considered it. I just, you know, I'm trying to find time to do stuff like that. That's where my major issue is, you know. Can you explain the treasury situation? In what in what way? Um, I'm sorry. Like, how did? In what way do you need to explain? Matt, I was in Nakanik. Is that how you say it? I can't remember. At the top of Bristol Bay. Repeat your thoughts on Fitch. I mean, it was, it's not, I mean, they're not very deep thoughts. I mean, it was just like when you go from a triple A rating down to a double A rating, I just wonder what it is that that's actually going to do to investment portfolios out there. Like, are people really going to be like, oh man, you got all these bonds in here with a, that were triple A, now they're double A plus, we got to get you to sell those things off. I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case for a lot of portfolios out there. And then as far as like the actual credit rating and adjusting the interest rates that are, that are on there, I mean, yeah, sure, I can imagine that it would add some risk to the idea of it, which would then put some kind of increase on the yield that, you know, they would end up paying, you know, as people would demand a higher, higher return for it. But again, going from AAA to AA, is that a major concern, you know, for, for those who are who are holders of the bonds or future idea holders of the bonds. I just don't see that being as significant of a deal as, as a lot of people might put it out there. Um, I'm surprised that it took this long. Like really, I figured the downgrade would have happened a lot earlier than this, but, you know. but again, maybe I'll, I'll try to put together a better video with thoughts on that, you know, so that I can explain it a little bit better for you. Uh, 6% Japanese bond yield. Uh, gosh, I heard <laughs> talking about teeth. Okay. Uh, dude, I want some Alaskan salmon. Yeah, no shit. Everybody does. Some of my favorite fish ever. Good evening. Good evening, Glenn. All right. Hi, folks. I'm in Mexico City going back to the U.S. for the first time in more than four months. Yeah. Don't FOMO. I think the peso is what I would get for short term against the de-dollarization trend if you go $500 or so to spare for a few months you might consider it I don't know I think it might be a little too late I think like you know unless you have the idea that you know I mean it could be that um, that the peso is going to continue to strengthen into the future but I have a belief that the peso is going to be peaking out at some point right and we may not be i don't know like i mean it can continue it might double from here who knows but i would just kind of assume that you know from the dramatic increases that have taken place you know over the short term that's happened here that it eventually find its top right i mean things don't go up forever you know when things you know overvalued to undervalued to overvalued you know this is some of the things that you know that you have to look at um Although it's been quite exciting for for the last few months and or so, I again like that's not going to last forever, and at some point it will peak out. And how far away are we from that? I think we're closer than what people think. All right, inflation is just starting. All right. Nobody wants to. Oh, you guys are talking about fish. Okay, nobody wants to give up their three percent thirty-year mortgage. I know I don't. Like, I mean, I couldn't even. Well, I guess like. I guess if I was able to sell the house for what the Zillow estimate is on it, then I would have a fairly decent, significant down payment. You know, who knows what I would be able to come up with from there. So, but still, like, 
the idea of taking on like a five, six, seven percent, or even eight percent mortgage is not not even appealing when you have a three percent mortgage going on. So, yeah, I mean, I know myself like I could hardly even pay rent for what I have for a house payment right now. All right. All right, Mexican coins, silver coins, better than U.S. coins. Uh, I don't know. Like, from a collector's point of view, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, from a weight point of view, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, unless you were trying to sell them, then I guess, like, you know, if you have, like, government-issued bullion as opposed to generic bullion, then you're probably going to have an easier time selling the government-issued stuff. So there is that, you know. Yellow just went bankrupt. If a lot of truckers leave and the industry goes bust, the rates will climb back higher, increasing the price of everything. Yes, it will. And that's exactly the bullwhip effect that I have been trying to sell people, that we are not out of the, the idea of shortages yet. You know, this oversupply, undersupply, oversupply, this takes a long time to find its equilibrium, right? I mean, think about what we had seen take place in lumber. It went from... 200 per thousand to 1700 per thousand down to like three or 400 per thousand back up to like 1200 per thousand down to where we're at now which is right at a little over 500 per thousand and that's a little bit different number because they changed the way they do the futures contracts a few months ago so but still even even with that we saw like dramatic price swings right Oversupply to undersupply to oversupply to undersupply. Right now, we're sitting in a position in which we were oversupplied, but now we are very much coming into inventory depletion, tightening levels. The only thing that keeps the how, keeps the the lumber prices from really shooting up right now is the fact that the home builder sentiment hasn't completely gone positive yet. Home buyer traffic is still very negative. Right. Once that turns positive, then I think that. Demand coming from the home builders going into lumber is going to be very extreme and we're going to start seeing some price increases going up from there. And of course, a lot of people are going to be like, what happened to your, you know, inflation scenario or no more inflation or whatever. It's not the case, right? It's, it's a supply and demand issue, right? And that's really what it comes down to. The demand coming from the builders right now is not significant enough to drive the prices up due to the supply that we have at the level that it is. It's just give it some time and that will change. Yeah. All righty guys, I'm going to give it like another 15 minutes here and then I'm gonna head out. Cause well, my phone's getting down to 30%, but. All right, infamous NYC. Thank you so much for the $2. Buy land, build a home, grow food, start a business. Absolutely. You know, that's that's really what it comes down to is like growing your own food is not only like one of the best ways to secure your own, right? But it's fun, right? It's enjoyable. When you growing anything is actually just a lot of fun. You know, just like you know, no matter what it is, even flowers or something like that, it doesn't matter what you grow. Watching watching a plant grow and producing something off of it is just like one of the greatest feelings in the world, just to have, you know, to have experience in that. But then on top of it, like the nutrition factor that comes from food that fresh is so significantly higher. Right? I mean it's not only does it taste better, but it's so much better for you. Right? And then on top of it, if you have enough of it, you can trade. You can sell. You can produce more than what you truly need. All that is just good stuff, man. I mean, no matter how you look at it. So, yeah, I totally agree. Like, my wife Sarah, you know, dishes every day. She uh, she has a wonderful garden going right now. And it was doing so well. Like, the tomatoes were just killer. And then a deer came through and, like, annihilated the tops off of all these plants that she had. And it was heartbreaking to see it. But, you know, it's just part of the experience. So, you know, put up some deer netting and, you know, continue back on with it and get some more to grow. You know, it's fun stuff. It's good. It's good times. All right. How will someone make 55 per hour do in your area? I looked at pipe fitter union pay scale for Oregon. I mean, I would imagine $55 an hour is going to be okay. I mean, it's going to, you know, you'll be able to make it, you know, a decent, decent living, I would guess. I mean, it's a very expensive area to live in. So, you know, I mean, 
at $55 an hour, there is probably some places in this country that would do so much better than they would in my area. You know, I mean, but it would, it would do, it would do good, I think, you know, I mean, you'd be able to, you know, have a house and, you know, do, do your thing or whatever. But as far as having like an exceptional income from that, no, that's, I don't believe that would be the case. All right, I think it takes some sort of skill to understand your finance cause, a, to understand your finance, because a lot of people don't understand what they're spending on. That's that's very true. I mean, in understanding, you know, understanding finance and economics for yourself is the only way you can really do it. Like, you can listen to somebody on YouTube explain, like, what their view of the economy is, but they're looking at their view from their, you know, 150 house portfolio, hundreds of millions of dollars, stock portfolio, you know, businesses or whatever. Very, very few people explain the economy from a position in which that you're just an average working dude living paycheck to paycheck and how it is that we see the economy and what it is that we need to do with our lives in order to benefit ourselves. Hardly anybody really talks like that when it, when it comes to economics, you know. I mean, they'll say like, you know, how damaging it is to the people, but they very rarely say, here, look at the economy in a way that you can then look at your own life and say, this is what I need to do in order to, to you know, to best profit, to best, you know, position myself, to best survive. You know, that's something that you have to figure out for yourself. Like, you know, again, like you can look at it from a political point of view, incorporate that into it, Make a bunch of decisions on what it is that you plan on doing your, with your life based on political outcomes, right? And then you sit around waiting for these political outcomes to take place, and then it really affects your life. But if you didn't take any of that position, like, you know, you don't look at political outcomes to make decisions on your life. You just don't even look at it. So when political outcomes do take place, it might have an impact on you, but it isn't the impact in which that the decisions that you made right? We're based off of that expectation. It's more like a reactionary thing that you have to do. And a lot of people will be like, here, I'm trying to protect myself and all that other stuff. Again, it's the view that you give it, right? We already talked about that. Like I need to do all these things in order to protect myself from this inevitable consequence that can happen. But yet you could have been looking at it like, how do I position myself for all the possible benefits and opportunities that could be coming, right? Instead, people protect themselves in fear instead of like, you know, positioning themselves for, you know, benefit. It's it's all about the way you look at it. You know? Infamous NYC, thank you so much for the five dollars. Uh, in my opinion, we need people competing in the local market so market share doesn't go to all one side. Learn soft, hard skills and offer it to the market. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and that's really where, like, staying local, I think, is really, like, kind of encourages that idea. You know, I had an idea one time to, it, you know, it's funny, because, like, how do you keep money in your local area, keep it from leaving? Right? So I thought it would have been funny to, to write Astoria dollar, like, on a particular dollar, and then get, like, the people out there to not use those dollars to go to a bank, right? But to only hand those to other people in Astoria and just keep the dollars, right? The Astoria dollars in Astoria exchanged between people and not going to the bank and to see how many, how much cash we could actually get to change hands here in Astoria just by simply writing Astoria on the dollar itself. Of course, I don't want to encourage defacing money and get in trouble for that, but I just kind of wonder what kind of, ex what would happen from an experiment like that, you know? All right. All right. 3% interest rate was a can't go wrong, you know, and that's the only, that was the one thing that was really giving me some sort of hope, right? Was like, holy crap, I got this mortgage at three and a quarter percent. Like that is like so low comparatively to the, to what everything that I had experienced from the past here in the stories from my parents and stuff like 3%, I didn't, like, to me, that was, like, unreal, and there's people who got even better than that, they were down in, like, the twos, you know, two and 2.75 or something. Uh, 
Simon the dice must be gifted. No soul in self bought die. <laughs> All right, man. I would take him. Yo, Stinger, you I hear. Stringer, you I hear. All right. On the contrary, I think cigarettes slowly on their way out. Fake new ports and fewer ingredients from Missouri ending up in Chicago land. For instance, yeah. I mean, to be honest, when I, when I gave up smoking, I thought it was only going to be a few years before I, there was nobody going to be smoking anymore. And that's not the case. I see people smoking all the time, like everywhere. And although it is a dying breed, you know. Um, I don't, I don't see it going anywhere. Like I, I see it just like, I mean, I do see people like quitting, less people smoking, but the demand for cigarettes is still quite prevalent, right? Tobacco too. I mean, chewing tobacco or whatever. I see people vaping, like, you know, they're hitting it up that way. Like the demand for nicotine I think is still very prevalent and I don't think that's going to go anywhere, you know. Right. I was looking at smoking, I would look at India. Hmm. Medicine stocks on the way on the way to go. Invest in tobacco then nicotine. Gold is money. Constitution says so. That's right, Grant. Um, in fact, it's Article 1, Section 10 of the United States Constitution that says no state shall coin anything but gold and silver as a legal tender and payment of debt. So anything outside of gold and silver is really unconstitutional and straight up illegal. <laughs> 70 cent dollar coming. Uh, that's basically what's happening with BTC. Agreed, Grant. UCC 401 talks about that, too. In fact, whenever I deposit a check, I request lawful money via UCC 411. Therefore, I am not liable for the Federal Reserve Notes excise tax. Wow, I'm going to have to figure out how that one works. So, that's, Old Nighter's the coolest. He is like the coolest sovereign citizen ever, man. All right. Uh, when do you think the fall of Rome will be for the U.S., and what will the outcome be? Um, what the fall? The fall is going to be like when everybody, when the U.S. treasuries are no longer held by countries or individuals or corporations or anything like that that will be like the fall you know is when that starts to happen how that looks when that takes place is beyond me because as right now i can't see anything that's going to replace that so as much as people would want it to be and they you know pinpoint ideas of like how it's you know evidence of it here and there i don't i don't see it taking place so all right Okay, guys, I'm going to give it three more minutes. I'm going to cruise down to the bottom of these chats here because it's been going... Oh, wow. You got, holy moly, that was a lot of chats. Okay, let me get up here just a little ways and we'll read a few of these towards the end. Sorry if I skipped over a bunch of the chats in the middle, but we have so many here and i got to get going. Who uses cash? You know, it's surprising. A lot of people use cash. I mean, I work retail at a lumber yard doing hardware, hard, lumber sales and hardware sales, and it's a, it's pretty substantial amount of people who are still using cash um you know i mean granted most of its accounts and credit cards but yeah we do a lot of cash transactions and you know what i find very amusing is when people thank me for ca counting their change back like i'm one of the few people who actually you know actually counts their change back to them and um you know that's something that like the younger crowd really just doesn't do i don't even think they know how you know all right. Uh, see how well the FBI likes that, UE. Uh, likes what? You know? <laughs> I had a similar idea putting pitchforks, oh, in place of the dollar. Are you talking about writing on the dollar? Yeah, I don't know if I like that idea. <laughs> you know, I, it was just a thought experiment, right? I don't think I was actually going to push that. Why do we need all the trillions of fiscal if things are good, bro? I didn't say things are good. In fact, good or bad is all about how you look at it, 
right? I mean, there, there's plenty of people out there killing it right now, making tons of money, and to them, things are just fine. They think it's good, right? Well, I'm not one of those people in that position. I don't think a lot of people are in that position, but some people are, right? So again, good or bad, it's all about the way that you look at it and how you, and how you positioned yourself for it. Yeah. I mean, to say that it needs to be a good economy out there for me, that's an expectation on something else, right? That's not you saying, I need to figure out what it is that's going on out there so I can best position myself to deal with this. I mean, you're, you know, to say a good or bad economy is basically saying that I have a politician's expectations to make my life better, you know, or an expectation of a politician to make my life better. There we go. That's how I should have said it. Uh <laughs> With credit downgrades earlier today, the blood will be on the sidewalks of Wall Street tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe. I, I mean, it very well could. I mean, there could be some panic situation that's taking place tomorrow because of the downgrade. I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. I, I mean, I, I think it's going to be... I mean, I think things are happening. I think it is, you know, significant in that sense. But I don't think it's going to be such a big deal that it's going to be causing blood in the streets. Like, I, I don't think that's this one yet, you know? I could be wrong. All right. So-called poor countries have a crazy demand for smoking. Smokeless tobacco is somewhat common. Yeah. When people are stressed and depressed, they smoke and drink alcohol. The cost of living has something to do with that. Yeah. Uh, I did, Matt, I got a quick video of a bear cub on the beach and a red fox in our camp. See my channel under the... A N H name. Uh, I'd rather people smoke that. Do drugs. Uh, this dude. This dude's an encyclopedia. Yeah, I kind of got a lot packed up in there, don't I? I just keep continue on with it. All right. I think about how popular cigarettes are in parts of Europe, and they are less common here. Government and community been slowly squeezing all right it's crazy when your own country makes a lot of citizens root for its fall yeah that's what i always wonder is it's like why are people rooting for the fall of the dollar you know it's going to end your way of life right you know i mean don't don't hope for that you know all right my name all nighter hider beware it's not professional channel <laughs> the professional it's professional af don't believe them <laughs> all righty guys all right, thank you so much. Thanks, Simon. I really enjoy your channel. Well, thank you, Joseph56. You guys are so awesome. I'm sorry I didn't get through all the comments today. That you guys had a lot of comments. That was that was very awesome. We had almost well, right now we got 195 of you up in the chats. Had $17.42 in super chats. 204 likes. Thank you so much for hitting that like button. That's really what gets this YouTube channel moving, gets it out there around, gets more videos shared with other people is really with the algorithm. Noticing that you're hitting the like button, noticing that you're comment commenting, that's really what gets this channel moving and gets it out there. Um, so thank you very much for everything you guys do to support the channel, to, you know, to do everything, you know, commenting in, you know, part of the conversations. This is really what it's all about. Man. And, um, I love doing this, and I love that you guys are, are here joining with me. So thank you so much, Uneducated Economist. You guys let me know.